I am very pleased to be talking to Daphne Keller. Daphne is a lawyer. She had been uh, an associate general counsel at Google uh, uh, in the past. She is now at the Stanford Law School. She is running a program on platform regulation as part of the Cyber Policy Center uh, at the Freeman Spogli Institute uh, and the law school at Stanford. And she is one of the leading experts on um, uh, platform regulation. So, Daphne, we're hitting a really big moment. <laughs> in we this. sure are. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a, a couple of court cases that have gone before the Supreme Court or are going to, and then a couple of state laws, uh, and they all relate to the platform's ability to either uh, publish what they want or not publish what they want. Uh, so the two court ca and they move in different directions. So the two court cases, Gonzalez and Tamne, both want uh, uh, the platforms to take down what they regard as harmful material. And the two state laws in Texas and, and Florida want to force the platforms to carry things that they might not otherwise carry. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about those issues. Sure. So I think that's a good summary and overview. Um, the two cases that the court uh, agreed to hear and already had oral arguments and will probably decide by maybe June of this year are both about when platforms should face liability for ISIS content mm -hmm. um, and the claims are brought by people who have family members die in ISIS attacks. So it's, you know, really horrific facts underlying the case. But the, you know, the thrust of, of the claims would be if the plaintiffs succeed, then the law will shift to require platforms to take down more content in ways that will probably cause them to take down truly illegal content and also a margin mm -hmm. of other, you know, maybe contentious or uh, gray area content around that. Mm -hmm. um, so that those two cases are people trying to push the law to make platforms take down more speech or content. And then, as you said, the two laws out of Texas and Florida are both uh, what's called must carry laws. So they uh, oblige platforms to carry speech that they don't want to. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit different. The Texas law says platforms can moderate content, but if so, they have to be viewpoint neutral, which probably means if you leave up anti-racist content, you also leave up pro-racist content. If you leave up anti-violence or anti-anorexia content, you have to also leave up the content uh, that promotes those things. Um, so that's the Texas law. And then the Florida law carves out special categories of, of speakers. Um, so uh, political candidates, how they, their speech basically can't be taken down at all. Same goes for people talking about political candidates and also journalistic entities widely defined. So they come at it different ways, mm -hmm. but they're both requiring platforms to leave up content that I think many people will find extremely offensive or dangerous mm -hmm. um, or you know morally repugnant. The, both of those laws also have transparency provisions mm -hmm. um, requiring pretty extensive new transparency measures from platforms. So those cases, um, people thought, or I thought, the Supreme Court would be hearing those cases this term. Mm -hmm. And it was a little bit of a surprise that they kind of kicked the can down the road. And they're now probably likely to take those cases in the fall. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, they, they took the two cases that are about liability and the law pushing platforms to take down more speech. Right. So uh, tell me a little bit about the defenses that the platforms are using to protect themselves against these uh, these suits. Because, you know, this involves First Amendment law and their right to determine what, you know, what it is they carry. So maybe you could talk about that a bit. Yeah, so the, the first two cases, the cases that are about uh, making platforms take down more content, obviously have huge consequences for speech on the internet. And there were a whole bunch of amicus briefs. Uh, and most of those briefs, many of those briefs were talking about consequences for speech. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the actual issue that the court will decide on is statutory. Mm -hmm. So one of the cases is about whether the platforms are immune under the law known as Section 230 uh, when they rank or algorithmically promote particular content. Mm -hmm. um, and the other, so it's a statutory question about s Section 230. And this is a court that's really obsessed with the language of statutes. And so they may rule, you know, really narrowly on this statutory language basis. And the companion case, Tomna, 
is about whether if you assume there's no 230 immunity, are the platforms liable under the Anti-Terrorism Act in the first place? And that too is sort of this careful statutory language type question. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, this whole environment of, uh, or, you know, set of consequences that have to do with speech, but yeah. those, those cases we can expect to be uh, decided on based on statute. Let's, let's back up a little bit yeah. though, because <clears throat> not everybody watching this is gonna be a lawyer that, understand some of these uh, concepts you're talking about. So Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, what was the background to that and the intent and, and how is it being used in the current uh, debate? Sure. So uh, this Section 230 was enacted along with the 1996 uh, telecommu telecommunications overhaul. So it was in the middle of this like very deregulatory moment in Congress that was mostly about um, older communications technologies, telephone and, and cable and so forth. Um, but they, they put in a section about the internet that included both a very, um, I guess you could say anti-speech or censorious mm -hmm. component, um, telling platforms or telling anyone on the internet that they could be liable for sharing indecent content. And then they also included this provision, Section 230, that was intended to free platforms up to be able to moderate content without getting sued over their choices or without having um, plaintiffs say, hey, you're acting like an editor of this content and therefore you're liable for things that your um, users said, like if a user posts defamation on the platform. So the, the two were enacted in parallel and then the part that was more censorious uh, went up to the Supreme Court and got struck down, leaving us with this sort of rump provision of Section 230, which didn't get a whole lot of attention at the time, um, but which was very much a product of this um, kind of almost this paired set of goals that seem a little paradoxical, but I think aren't, uh, which was to encourage platforms to moderate and to take down uh, offensive but lawful content mm -hmm. or find and take down illegal content, um, but also to leave them free to be very pro-free expression and leave lots of things up. Um, and the lawmakers recognized that if platforms were not immunized for unlawful content on their platforms, they would be scared to go out and do the moderation. Mm -hmm. um, the immunities in CDA 230 are only for civil claims um, so that it doesn't extend to federal crimes. Platforms still face the same mm -hmm. liability mm -hmm. as anyone else if DOJ wants to prosecute them. Um, and there's a big carve out for intellectual property. So things like copyright mm -hmm. are, are treated separately. Well, let's talk though about freedom of speech because a lot of conservatives say that their freedom of speech is being violated by the platforms, but that's actually not the way that the First Amendment works, right? Uh, well, this week, <laughs> it's not the way that the First Amendment works. We'll see what the court does. Um, yeah, so in there's always a tension between the First Amendment rights are the speech interests of speakers who want to be able to say sometimes, you know, very offensive or controversial things mm -hmm. online and who are angry mm -hmm. if, you know, YouTube takes down their video, for example, um, versus, on the other hand, the First Amendment rights of the platforms themselves to set editorial policy. Um, and I think for a lot of people, it is intuitive that the users should have the stronger rights, but that is definitely not what the precedent from the Supreme Court for the last century has said. You know, in cases about cable companies, for example, or in a case about whether a parade operator could exclude a particular float of gay rights activists, um, the court has said, yeah, this aggregator of third party speech, the cable company or the parade operator has editorial rights that generally will prevail and will prevent uh, would be speakers from demanding a right to be mm -hmm. heard on mm -hmm. that particular platform. And so until recently, every case that had been brought by users suing platforms saying, hey, you have to carry my speech, you can't take it down, which is more than 70 cases. Every case had been won by the platforms, um, whether because of their rights under Section 230 or because of the platform's own First Amendment rights or other reasons. So the, just to make this uh, point, you, you have this nice phrase in one of your articles about content that is lawful but awful and really the freedom that Section 230 gives the platforms is really directed at that stuff, right? That 
There's plenty of content that is protected by the First Amendment, but we don't want children to see, you know, bad stuff, or we don't want, you know, a lot of things that, that are, most people would agree is, is pretty bad, and the platforms have been exercising that ability to suppress that kind of speech. Exactly. And, and if they weren't doing that, you would go onto Facebook and see a whole lot of pornography and a whole lot of um, very scammy commercial offers and uh, some amount of really horrific things like beheading videos. Mm -hmm. The internet would just look vastly different and would be far less appealing or useful for people who actually want to, uh, you know, engage in civil conversation mm -hmm. or send pictures to their grandmothers or, you know, whatever. Um, and, and so the, the moderation that the platforms are freed up to do by the First Amendment, but more directly by Section 230, because mm -hmm. it's such a, a robust immunity, um, you know, gives us an Internet that's useful for most mm -hmm. people. It, none of us agree on what the margins should be of mm -hmm. what the platforms take down in that lawful but awful range. And so, like, I don't think it is um, surprising or, you know, bad that there are conservatives who say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I disagree with this removal. I think the mm -hmm. line of what they take down should be drawn somewhere else. But I don't think, you know, even though it's kind of a talking point on the right right now to say platforms should be common carriers, they mm -hmm. should have to carry everything that's legal. I don't think anyone actually they wants really <laughs> that, want that internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's very interesting. And, um, Another issue uh, is the way that the platforms are actually different from legacy media publishers, right? So nobody can test the right of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Daily News to basically not publish certain content, right? That's sort of inherent in being a publisher. Uh, and, you know, one defense of the platforms is that they're actually performing that kind of a function. But uh, it does seem to me that the scale of the platforms makes a difference here, you know, where most legacy media simply doesn't reach hundreds of millions of people around the world at the speed at which the platforms operate. So do you think that that is a legitimate, uh, I mean, you know, I, I guess the, the conclusion from that would be to say that they actually do constitute a kind of public space, uh, and if they abridge somebody's right to say what they want, it does have freedom of speech consequences. What, what do you think? Yeah, so I think there's a really interesting nexus with competition here mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the, the claim that, that many people who are angry at platforms make mm -hmm. is, look, there is no way to reach a large audience. There's no way to be heard sufficiently unless I am present on YouTube or unless I am mm -hmm. present on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and that's there's something you know a, appealing and logical about that that you know if a platform has become so central to public discourse mm -hmm. that not being there makes it so much harder to speak um you know maybe people should have more of a right and th this logic is built into the first amendment cases so i mentioned there are cases about cable companies being compelled to carry um in one case it's local broadcast and the court did say the cable companies have a First Amendment right, but then they said, and Congress can override it in this particular case, in part because they have this bottleneck control mm -hmm. over access to people's TVs. Mm -hmm. So at some point, if centralized control over speech becomes too great, mm -hmm. there is a, a constitutional ground to override mm -hmm. the platform's control. Mm -hmm. But in the case of the internet, you absolutely can still be heard by other channels. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that you've been completely silenced. And so, you know, people have different... We haven't had this situation mm -hmm. before, and people have different there, opinions. There's one that was a little bit comparable, though, right? When broadcast TV was dominated by three big networks, you had this thing called the Fairness Doctrine, where mm -hmm. the FCC actually mandated that they... Uh, you know, had to carry opposing content. This is something that Republicans really uh, hated. But in the Red Lion case, you know, the Supreme Court said that's in line with the, the First Amendment. Uh, so which of the laws has a comparable thing about must carry the opposite viewpoint? Is it, is it Florida or Texas? Um, I mean, it's, it's Texas. 
But they don't um, like that argument, right? They don't like the <laughs> red lion precedent. Traditionally, Republicans have hated the red lion precedent, uh, you know, and maintained that it was unconstitutional. President Reagan was very opposed to it and uh, vetoed an act of Congress that would have sort of reinstated it at one point. Um, but it, the comparison doesn't hold that well between broadcast TV and internet platforms because the the justification the court gave for mm -hmm. saying it's okay to make broadcasters carry things was because spectrum for broadcast is scarce and we have accepted as a society that the FCC is going to come in and regulate it you know, for the public good and, and divvy up channels and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And so there's this starting point of scarcity of the communications resource mm -hmm. that made the, the fairness doctrine acceptable to the court. And there is no comparable scarcity mm -hmm. online. You can say there's a scarcity of attention and the platforms control access to it, but you know that's not an argument that courts have accepted in the past. Yeah, yeah. Um, but platform scale still does matter and the ability to amplify certain messages over others is a kind of critical component of their discretionary power over, over political speech. Now, uh, maybe you can say a little bit more about these uh, state laws because I take it that uh, they're going to have potentially a lot of unanticipated consequences. I mean, for example, in a red state, you know, if you must carry a conservative voice, you then must also carry a liberal voice, right? And that's something that a lot of these legislators may not be seeking. Yeah, I think in both cases, these legislators were having a lot of fun and having a theatrical moment passing these anti-platform laws. And I don't think they seriously expected them to come into effect and be enforced. They certainly didn't draft them very carefully. There's just so many random things in them and, you know, exceptions that don't make sense and definitions that don't make sense. Um, and, and so the idea that we might have a future where these very long, very detailed and very poorly considered laws actually come into effect is a little mind boggling. So far, um, the laws have not come into effect because lower courts um, suspended them. In one case, the Florida law made it up to the 11th Circuit, and the 11th Circuit said the platforms are right, this law is mostly unconstitutional, and struck it down. In the other case, the Texas law made it up to the 5th Circuit and got this remarkable opinion going in the other direction saying, no, the Texas law is fine. Platforms themselves are the censors. Platforms can't possibly have a First Amendment argument. And so this, this law uh, can come into effect. Yeah. And ultimately, that is going to have to be resolved by the Supreme Court, right? And do you have any idea how the current court would come down on these issues? Well, we have very strong signals from two justices, uh, both conservative um, and pulling in completely opposite directions. Mm -hmm. So Clarence Thomas has written a couple of opinions, I guess you'd call them, sort of spontaneous additions of uh, um, unnecessary <laughs> commentary uh, on top of just declining to review some other cases where he said he thinks platforms perhaps should be treated as common carriers mm -hmm. or should be treated as um, providers of public accommodations, so kind of like a, you know, a restaurant or a hotel. Um, and, and so, you know, presumably he will think these laws are either constitutional or, you know, with some improvements could be constitutional. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, by contrast, when he sat on the D.C. Circuit, wrote a dissenting opinion saying he thought even the operators of ISPs, it was a case about net neutrality and requiring, you know, infrastructure level uh, ISPs to, to be neutral in, in their carriage rules. He said, no, they have a First Amendment right to exclude anything they want. And he explicitly listed platforms like YouTube as analogs saying, obviously, they have a First Amendment right to exclude. And so Kavanaugh is in this position that's, I think of it as almost like a, a pro-property rights position, um, which, by the way, is where Clarence Thomas used to be uh -huh. <laughs> back when uh -huh. these cases were about cable companies. Well, conservatives <laughs> used to be libertarian and they're not yeah. anymore, right? And yeah. So Ka Kavanaugh's kind of holding down the old school conservative position mm -hmm. and and Clarence Thomas is is uh, down with must carry obligations. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, though, you know, it is, it is very much a mystery. Mm -hmm. We will know more... Um, both after 
the two cases they're hearing now come down. We'll get mm -hmm. more clues about what any of them think about the internet. There's also a case pending called 303 Creative, mm -hmm. which is about whether a webmaster who b designs websites for clients um, can refuse service for um, a web page about a gay marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you can see how that's kind of comparable. She, can she be compelled mm -hmm. in her professional capacity um, to accept something she disagrees with, mm -hmm. um, which she, on religious grounds. And so we'll get some clues from, from those cases, mm -hmm. but right now it's kind of a mystery. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, switch over to the discussion of a uh, topic that we've both written about, which is middleware, <laughs> all right? Uh, so as I think about this uh, conundrum that these different cases pose for American democracy, uh, we're kind of at a stage of uh, having an unsolvable problem, right? Uh, you know, you don't want to allow platforms to force them to carry everything. You want some moderation. In fact, you absolutely need that moderation for the reasons that you said. But given our present polarization, uh, it is very hard to imagine a European-style consensus, you know, around what's acceptable political speech and what's not that would take in both sides. And, you know, that was the old idea behind the Fairness Doctrine, but that died a long time ago. So under the current conditions where, uh, you know, the red and blue sides don't agree on the you know, legitimacy of vaccine denials and, you know, various other kinds of speech, uh, it's, it's really hard to imagine that the government can ever, you know, uh, revive something like a, a fairness doctrine. On the other hand, it does seem to me that just in principle, it's not legitimate for a private corporation to be making these decisions when they have that much power, when they have the scale that uh, Google and Facebook and, and, and Twitter do. Uh, their motives are not the protection of American democracy. Their motives are their own bottom lines, and they're still going to be committed to, to serving those in ways that don't meet public interest. So, uh, Self-regulation has got real limitations, government regulation has real limitations, but it does seem potentially that you could solve this through competition, right? So maybe you can talk to that. Yeah, and there's, there's a line in um, the article that you wrote with the Stanford group on this that I always point people to, uh, you know, calling, calling the, the platform's power over public discourse a loaded gun mm -hmm. <laughs> that is sitting there waiting to be used. And yeah. whether you believe that the current platform operators are abusing that power or not, mm -hmm. the fact that it exists is just begging someone to come along and use it. Yeah. And, and it could be someone who's like a foreign government that controls access to a lucrative market, mm -hmm. for example, and mm -hmm. who has leverage over the platform operators By the for that way, reason. Uh, we actually have an example of somebody picking up that gun, which is Elon Musk, right? Yes. <laughs> Twitter had been fairly liberal in its content moderation. He didn't like that, so he bought the company, and mm -hmm. now he's flipped it over to being, you know, much more conservative. And, uh, and, and not just much more conservative, but also just overtly prioritizing himself personally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's not just a shift in ideology. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Right, you're not going to hear lots of criticism of China on Twitter anymore, I think. Right. I mean, and just to like unpack that more, be, because he has other commercial interests and in Tesla in particular, mm -hmm. um, having access to markets in China and markets around the world. And so just the, the financial incentives get very complicated mm -hmm. once he enters mm -hmm. the picture. Um, yeah. So, you know, as you said, we can't we cannot rely on government to come to pass laws to mm -hmm. come in and solve the problems of lawful but awful speech because the first amendment definitely precludes that mm -hmm. you know they might be able to come in and regulate a little bit more speech than they do now but this whole swath of of things that users rely on platforms to moderate we will never you know absent some huge change in our constitutional mm -hmm. interpretation we we will never have the government come in and and uh tell them how to moderate that. And at the same time, uh, many people feel that having these giant, you know, the, the, the platform owners with the gun sitting on the table there, <laughs> that's not legitimate and it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea behind a middleware response is to try to take the centralized power that platforms hold now over discourse and setting the rules for content moderation and the rules for ranking and what comes down um, and push that power out from the center to a more diverse group of entities. 
Um, Which was kind of the original vision of the internet itself, right? That you wouldn't have any kind of centralized control over speech and people could choose, you know, what they wanted to listen to, who they wanted to talk to. Absolutely. And this, so this was, as a technical matter, what was called end-to-end -end design, meaning you have relatively dumb pipes in the middle and then smart devices at the margin, meaning like a user's browser or maybe now a user's mobile phone, that enforce the rules the user wants and that you know push control really out to the individual. And you can see in Section 230, it's very much contemplating that. It talks about immunizing platforms per, for providing or immunizing tech companies for providing tools that let mm -hmm. users exercise that individual control. Um, none of the efforts to fully put that power in the hands of users have really worked and it's for this scale reason that you identify. You know, there isn't some magic technology that would allow every individual to set their own preferences and, and then, you know, a machine would detect what of the <laughs> tidal wave of internet content meets mm -hmm. those preferences. Um, and so, you know, it seems like the reality is really you need some companies that are, you know, not all the way at the margins of the network, but partway there and who offer the internet, the users, this kind of moderation as a service. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, you know, part of the reasoning behind, I think, the model of middleware that you and I both talk about is assuming that you can't really break up a Twitter or right. a YouTube um, because of network effects. They will re-aggregate. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't just create a world where they're fully separate companies um, and, and don't have a user's ability to interact with the large yeah. group of people they rely on interacting and with. And in now. any event, the current interpretation of antitrust law will make this an incredibly difficult, prolonged process. I mean, nobody wants to go through an AT&T or an IBM, you know, type litigation. Well, but I don't know how you get to middleware without some legal change. Well, yeah, so, no, but, but probably not through antitrust, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so the, you know, in, in, a, in a middleware universe or middleware internet, maybe you could go to YouTube and say, I don't want these uh, results ranked in the way that YouTube is offering. I instead want to subscribe to the Disney ranking or the ESPN ranking mm -hmm. or the ACLU ranking um, or my church's ranking. And maybe also I have a, um, you know, I, I am a feminist and I don't want content that seems um, degrading to women or I don't want my child to see Disney princesses. So I'm also going to subscribe to an mm -hmm. overlay of like a block list from a feminist organization that provides that. And, you know, you can imagine having multiple sources that the users trust more than they trust Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. um, or, or, uh, or the YouTube leadership. Um, and users get to choose those in lieu of YouTube as the providers of the, the ranking and the content moderation. And that uh, ability to choose has a value in itself, right? Because at the moment, uh, we're subject to these algorithms that are completely non-transparent where the platform makes these decisions for us. Uh, we can't really affect them. Uh, and, you know, you'd be giving choice back to users by doing something like this. All right, so let's talk about some of the practicalities of this. Uh, if another outside company does the rankings or determines what you're going to see, that hits directly at the business model of the platforms who use their knowledge of precisely your preferences to target uh, ads at you, and presumably they won't be able to do that, or that power is going to be, uh, you know, seriously diminished under this scheme. So how how do we deal with this? Well, I mean, I think this is actually an interesting hitch in the middleware proposal that I don't think you and I have talked about before. Is that you know the in order to truly compete with the platforms um, in providing ranking that you will like. They don't just need to have access to the whole pool of content that is available for ranking. They also would need to know as much as the platform does about you mm -hmm. and your behavioral signals about what you like. And so, you know, so then are we talking about a law that compels platforms to not only let some new, maybe fly by night, <laughs> third party business come along and look at every single video someone has uploaded or every uh, post, including private posts on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, 
also, if this third party is going to um, really offer appealing ranking that competes with the platform, they would need to know more about you and your behavior. Of course, you, the, the you who has signed up for this service, presumably you have consented to have this third party potentially fly by night company know more about you. And so mm -hmm. it's not too complicated as a matter of privacy law, I think, for the user to say, I'm already sending all this data to YouTube, but I want my ranking from flybynightcompany.com. Mm -hmm. um, and so I consent to let all my behavioral data that YouTube sees also mm -hmm. go to them. Mm -hmm. What's more complicated is if I am a YouTube user or a Facebook user and some of my friends shared their content with me privately, they did not consent mm -hmm. for fly by night middleware provider to see their yeah. content. Yeah. But if, if the provider is going to rank my feed or mo moderate things, it needs to be able to see that content or it can't do a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it seems to me that if this were, well, so one of the big business model questions is, are w people actually willing to pay for this service? Neil Stevenson actually has a science fiction book set in the, 17 years in the future in which people pay for the ability to have decent content, you know, in their internet feeds. But it's not clear that people are willing to pay all that much. Uh, it's one of those things where if this were such a good and desirable service, it should exist already, you know. And there are some companies that have been trying to, like NewsGuard, you know, they're trying to provide uh, this sort of uh, uh, moderation. But it's not hit the big time, right? So that suggests that you probably would need a regulatory regime that would force this opening for, for middleware companies. Yeah, so I think you would need a, a law compelling the platforms to allow this to happen in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then you would need a law that somehow resolves this privacy question we've mm -hmm. identified. And I don't think there's a magic bullet that protects privacy and serves this competition and middleware goal. Mm -hmm. So I think that one would be a, a painful trade-off. And in the EU, under the GDPR, with its much stricter rules, it might be an impossible trade-off. I don't mm -hmm. know how you solve the privacy law barriers um, in the EU without really changing some things mm -hmm. about the GDPR. Mm -hmm. Although, doesn't that really only apply to Facebook, where you are what you see is really your friend's content, whereas in Google searches and Twitter feeds, you know, that's that's not so much an issue. So I, I think for Google search, because all of that is from public websites that mm -hmm. anybody, in principle, anybody could, could also crawl, um, what you said is correct. I think, so when I went, there is such a thing as, as uh, private accounts on Twitter. I have a few friends whose accounts are private, meaning I see their posts, but other people can't and I mm -hmm. can't retweet them. When I went digging for data on how many accounts are private on Twitter, the only reliable looking source I found said it's about 10%. Mm -hmm. um, I can't vouch for that number. But, but if it's 10%, that's you know, meaningful even mm -hmm. for Twitter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, politically, uh, the middleware idea does not seem to be going anywhere at the present moment. Well, uh, no platform regulation ideas are, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in Congress at least. The states, the states are different. <laughs> I wonder whether, though, the conundrums of the existing efforts to change the rules for platform regulation may at some point force people to recognize that this is really the only reasonable solution, right? That you don't want the government to determine, you know, the rules. You don't want these big companies to determine the rules. Uh, you do want choice and, you know, you do want competition. and. Seems to, so I used to think that this was a kind of interesting idea that should be entered into the debate. And as I thought about, you know, the current, um, you know, real uh, uh, blind alley that we're in right now, uh, this is the only way I can think of going forward, uh, you know, to restore this original vision of the Internet as a place where you could determine, you know, what you wanted to see and not have some big... Uh, entity, whether a government or a company, do that for you. Yeah, it just seems like if you don't go in some version of the middleware route, there are dead ends in every direction. Like either you run into the First Amendment as a barrier to the government stepping in, or you accept, you know, the the remarkable control over discourse that we have right now in the hands of platforms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's hope that, you know, 
the politics around this changes. We will be watching this very closely. Hopefully we can talk again after some of these court decisions have come down and these justices now, you know, expose what they really think about these issues. But it's interesting that it's not a pure left-right issue, right? That uh, No, uh, so I, was, I went to oral arguments mm -hmm. um, for the two cases, Gonzalez and Tomna, um, and they were amazing. Like, mm -hmm. the justices, we'd all been worried that they wouldn't understand the magnitude of the situation, they wouldn't understand the implications of accepting what the, the plaintiffs wanted, and they asked such smart questions, mm -hmm. every single one of them, and there was so little politics on display. Like, mm -hmm. it really, it's sort of like what in middle school civics or something uh -huh. you're taught the Supreme Court should be. It was uh -huh. a very nice moment. Yeah, well, that's that's nice to know. Let's hope they can keep it up. <laughs> keep it up, guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Daphne Keller, thank you very much. That was a really fascinating discussion, and it's one that is changing. The situation is changing so rapidly, so we'll have to talk about this again uh, down the road. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me.